Genetic potential, the defining source of an athlete's talent and performance. What is it and how do we go about understanding it? tending to it, and ultimately unleashing it. We want to really get to the bottom of what we're seeing in the world. We are running drills, we're testing ideas, putting theories down. Of these are the essential questions to be asked and answered on the Genetic Potential Show. Welcome back to GPTV. I'm Brian McKenzie. I'm Kelly Starrett. This week, we're uh, talking about the largest experiment in uh, sports history, I think. Uh, it's, it's definitely sports history. We are in the middle of the CrossFit Open. 138,000, 140,000 competitors I've seen. Um, by the time this, this episode airs, I think we're going to be at the last week of competition. But for us, it's really opened up a whole host of ideas and concepts. Because when, you, when you're as transparent as you can possibly be, with uh, the outputs, the videos, the, the kind of va the volume of information we're seeing and it, this data set, there's some things to talk about. What about like, I mean, just think about the evolution of, of this thing that like where it started as, hey, just show up for the games to now it's like, hey, you're gonna qualify. <laughs> now it's an open to where everybody and anybody can enter for 20 bucks and it, this is how many people are actually interested in doing this thing. Even, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's an incredible testament to the power of, I think, what's happened with this community, what's happened with this sport, I guess. Um, you know, and, and it, it just blows my mind at how fast this thing's really grown, even though we always kind of knew that the wheels were there for this thing once the, you know, the real world caught on to what we were doing, what we all were doing and taking part in. And uh, I, I just, I, I just, it's, it's amazing to see this transformation. If we do, if you extrapolate the math out, I mean, that's, let's just say it's a hundred, like, what is that? 750,000 data points in a single five week period. I mean, that, I mean, I don't know if you could coordinate 750,000 people to just even watch a YouTube video. That's a phenomenon, right. much less the, the amount of data. We said earlier in our first show that this is our sort of an epoch we're living in. It's a renaissance. We're tearing down the walls. Of, of performance as it relates to, hey, I've got my little secret nut program, my squirrel program, right? And, uh, and suddenly people are talking. And I think what we're, what we're seeing in the middle of is all of these athletes sharing concepts, seeking this bigger conversation, and then realizing that we are not the first person to have run this experiment. I mean, there are a lot of people from a lot of different fields working on this sort of same sets of problems. And what are the best practices coming out of that? I mean, yeah. I think right now, uh, great show. Christy Phillips is going to come on. Yes. She is a super stud and talking about her evolution as an athlete. And I don't know if you know the background. She's working with uh, Carl Pally right there on being even more of a ninja. Um, one of our coaches over here in the corner, Diane Fu, is Skyping with an uh, Olympic lifter, you know, solving technical problems. I mean, where, cats are sleeping with dogs. I mean, like, it's, what's going on? It, it's about time. That's what I got to say. You know, I mean, this is something that I've uh, always kind of dreamed of, of like, you know, why, why hasn't more of this world merged? Which, which is one of the things that I saw like with the endurance world where there was that lack of a real strength and conditioning program occurring and where we could really take pieces of these things from uh, these other sports or these other things like why was it that runners didn't have a serious strength and conditioning program going on? Oh, we're afraid of bulk. But what if we actually implemented something that really didn't have to apply something to all that bulk, but we were still focusing on, hey, by the way, you're you know, in missing internal rotation and hip extension, Brian McKenzie. <laughs> I'm not going to say you were that guy running a long shot in the back, peeing on the woods. Just but something was weird. I don't know that it was that funny. far. It, like, but <laughs> Let me just say, he got shot in the back and was peeing in the desert. It was pretty <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Next time I went over to his house, that photo was not on the wall. Hey, Mark, I, I feel you. I feel you. Um, what's fun is I am, uh, people think of me as mobility, right? They think about that's sort of my kind of handle. But what really people don't understand about the, under, the underneath that is I really am obsessed with position and then I have a set of tools that are pretty good about explaining what full position are, like the skill transfer exercises. And I, the reason I bring that up is we're seeing in the last, I don't know, let's just say take a snapshot of our week, right? It's been an amazing week. And what we're finding is that the best athletes, across, just like it's happened on the other sports. Who have you worked with this week? Uh, let's see, I'm seeing, trying to think who we had our hands on. Um, extraordinary, extraordinary engines and really sophisticated athletes. Jen Jones, I uh, got to hang out with Gretchen Kittleberger. Uh, we have Christy Phillips here. We had um, Sarah Hopping. 
Um, who else? Katie Hogan. Um, we have Courtney Walker here. Some other girls. Iceland Annie. Here. Oh, Iceland Annie was here. Oh. Annie Torres' daughter was here on Monday. I was, uh, you know, and I just so happened to work with. I had Gretchen was out here the other week with me. I was with Rich Froning and Dan Bailey this weekend working with them. And you're just um, name dropping, bro. Oh. Whoa. So I, I think what's interesting though is uh, really sets up this this better conversation. Is one, we're very lucky because we get to see behind the scenes of all the best athletes. I think there's something special that's occurring here though. And, and it's what we just brought up. And it, not just the name dropping that's going on, but these athletes are actually really starting to catch on to something. Like what is this whole, what, what is this whole coaching thing? What is this whole thing that's going on versus just the programming, right? Well, um, and you're right. I mean, if we look at every cycle of the, of the games, which I am, I mean, let me just be clear. I love the games. I just think it's the greatest expression of, of how much better we can get. And if you look at the day one, I mean, the first workouts, we were just it was so nascent. We're so, we're such a beginning community. And all of a sudden, you laughing because I just said nascent. Yeah. It's, it's, dirty, okay. it's not a dirty word. You can look it up. It's not like saying Oreo balls. <laughs> so uh, if we look at where we come, the, the level of sophistication from from year to year, the, the technical competency. And I really think it, it, it highlights some of the, the patterns that we've seen in, in the CrossFit sport where we've made the same mistakes. Like, for example, we're seeing that the best athletes are getting good programming, but the rest of us are trying to emulate them are making some fundamental mistakes. Like, have you ever heard that before in running? Well, uh, you know, it's uh, very interesting you bring that one up. Now, this has been kind of a topic of our conversation for a very long time, uh, but you know, we, we tend to see people like Orion Hall or even some Kenyan or H Haley Gabber Selassie, and we see the rest of the world kind of want to emulate this whole thing that's happening. And even though they realize they're not going to be doing 100 or maybe even 150 mile a week of running, they do try and pack on the miles and, and, and follow a very similar program to these athletes, yet they don't understand that not only are these athletes physiologically in a much different place than they are, but mechanically speaking, what's going on there as well? Um, we see people who are actually running really well can handle that type of volume versus people who really are making some very fundamental mistakes and then repeating and continuing to try and ramp up the volume on these things, which is where we came with our paradigm shift in, hey, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, why don't we focus on these fundamental movement problems, which is exactly where you come from with your coaching and not just as a PT and what you do within your practice or even within mobility. Right. It's, hey, we've got a set of tools here where, hey, I'm applying these same tools as well, right? Um, uh, although not a classically trained PT or, you know, um, I know. It's that with dance hands? <laughs> you I know, know, that's I, what I'm saying. So, I, I, I have this set of tools that I've been following as well like you and we, we set these things up and we find out that this programming thing isn't necessarily the same thing as this coaching thing. Well, I really like what Floyd Landis, the cyclist said. He's like, whoever works the hardest wins. And someone's like, well, what about overtraining? And he's like, well, if you didn't train, and when I when we say train, that means nutrition, sleep, adaptation, mechanics. If you didn't train hard enough to be able to train that hard, see rule number one, whoever trains the hardest wins. I mean, you, the, really the, the nuances of preparation. And what I think was interesting in the internet phenomenon world, we're seeing, I know, across platforms is that you can sort of subscribe to a guru and follow their programming. We have this conversation with John Wellborn. I have this all the time. He's like, look, CrossFit football, he, he develops a really, really excellent program, one of the best for a biased power athlete, short duration. I'm a rugby player. I play hockey. I play football. This is a fant I'm a power athlete. Right? Here's conditioning. Here's strength. But he's like, dude. I can't program for 15, 20,000, 30,000 people. You need coaching. I can't program, and, and I, I have said this exact same thing with what we have on CrossFit Endurance, and I've also followed that up with, I'm not programming for elite athletes on that website. This is a program that's gonna get you started and get you rolling. Any elite athlete is seeking coaching, is seeking somebody who's got their eyes on them, and fixing those problems. And I think this is where you and I have been in, in, in this whole 
shift towards is look it's about getting these athletes in here and you've got a gal in the back here who's making a lot and we'll talk to her later but is making some real big changes this year as to what she's doing and she's been here for all week right talk how many different coaches has she been to where is she headed next well what we, are all of these athletes starting to do one, all, of the, one of the fundamental conversations we're having regularly with people is saying how do we define athlete well one of our definitions of athlete is a uh, person who can pick up the new skill the fastest. So Correct. They, see, they see holes, they can pick up a new skill, and they can integrate that into their body of work, right? It has to be about this body of work. Um, had the head strength and conditioning coach for NC State in my course this weekend, and he's like, people have forgotten and looked at the body of work that athletes have done, to your point. Like, you gotta, you gotta understand, they didn't just arrive to train this hard. You know, Aaron's training volume, Aaron Kafaro's training volume is phenomenal, but it's not that phenomenal in the context of what she could do and in the context of how much she's done to get ready for there but also this kind of this notion of you know I can't just suddenly replicate this freakish output I really have to be nuanced about mechanics so how do I pick up the, the new skill the fastest and how much better can I get year to year which is the second conversation my question really is for the athlete you know that, that I'll work with is how good are you at the fundamentals how good are you at the fundamentals of what it is at the core of what you want to do? Because then it's just a training. If you if right. you if you move well yeah. and you understand, then it really is just hey, we just need a year or two years to get really strong, and it takes a long time to build a big aerobic base, and just we're trained. But what we're seeing is, I can follow your program, and as long as I have a type one error, which means I I don't understand good running mechanics, I don't understand good lifting mechanics, or or these things, I'm never going to solve or derive the full benefit from the program. What I'm gonna do is hide my def deficiencies with high volume, and then suddenly when I flame out or don't perform, you know. And we're just, we're just gonna get ourselves on the cyclical pattern of reinforcing we, these poor we've movement We've done patterns. this before. Yeah. You know, this when I, all, I looked at, all. you know, I paddled on the national team, you know, and it was, try, tried to be a high level paddler, and you know, I paddled till my hand went numb, you know, and couldn't turn my head, and everyone was like, oh yeah, it's totally normal. And I was like, what do you mean it's totally normal? And he's like, well, like, well, you're training three times a day, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, well, yeah, I mean, I'm all Quasimodo three times a day. Is that what you mean? Is that a problem that I can't turn my head? So, I mean, I, I think I paddled myself into a hole, and then everyone's like, that's normal. It's not normal. No. And what, I think what we're seeing is the paradigm shift of athletes getting coaches. And, and what's funny is, in this sport, you're seeing Dan and Rich live together, train together, have training partners. We're seeing athlete camps where people are getting together and that has been replicated and done in every sport across every platform my you know my recommendation to coaches and athletes right now is this experiment's been run you've got to pick your head up and look around and see how people are doing this yeah I mean, yeah, this is all you need stuff. coaching staff. Yeah, this is all stuff that's been done before in other sports, and now we're finally kind of really picking that up within the CrossFit world. I mean, I, and I, I'll be honest. I mean, you know, like, you know, Rich is an extraordinary athlete and, and really understands, you know, his capacity better. At the same time, I never have to have a conversation with train volume because that's the, or his training and his plan because that's not where I fit in necessarily. You know, and it's interesting you say that because it's – if you were to actually take a look at what he's doing with his training volume, yeah, it is high, but he's literally attacking these things that he know that, that the coaching where a coach has stepped in and said, hey, work on this or fix this. And, you know, one, of the, thing, one of the things I told him this last week and was, was get on some glute ham raises. You need to start doing this to develop that knee flexion, to understand that pulling mechanism. And the kid was already implementing that that night. Like, that was done deal. Not even, you know. You mean his quads and pecs are big enough? Yeah. Impossible. Impossible. So, you know, for example, I think a, a fundamental conversation is that people misunderstand is that we're looking at volume where we should be looking at density, right? Yes. So let's say yeah. you've been hanging out with the swimmers or right. with, the, with the surfers, right, on some of the world's best surfers and been around them. Are you noticing that they're spending three or four hours out in the water at a time? No. Weird. I sat, I, I, I've been to Hawaii uh, I, maybe four or five times in the last couple of months uh, and spent a lot of time on the North Shore. And I, I've actually been sitting at the Volcom houses and watched what's happening with all these professional surfers. And it's literally, the, it is going in for like an hour, coming out, going back out for an hour, coming back in, going back out. It's like this whole thing of like, I'm going out, getting it done, getting 
getting some good waves. Quality. Quality waves. Paddle hard. Getting back, and this is right in front of pipeline. This isn't like we're just talking little surf. This is like the world's most dangerous wave here, right? And these guys go out, surf this thing, come back in, recover, get back out, recover, nap. get back, yep, nap. It's all, and it's weird, but that's the same type of thing I'm starting to see <laughs> around here yeah. versus just spending all that time in one place and just, oh, I'm going to get it all done right now. Well, and I think maybe even like my understanding of, like, example, with Rich's programming, the way he gets a lot of little doses in, and that allows him to revamp, get his nervous system fired up, hit it again, come back, revamp, hit it again. And I think that's shocking to people who maybe spent, lurk three or four hours in the gym or, or ascribe to a program where there's just lots and lots of volume. Well, now I'm on Metcon P7. Yes, you know, right? And I think what's interesting is we're, if we start to scale through the best practices of all those top level athletes, we're going to see that there are certain patterns emerge. That's where we've got to go. That's, I am such a fan. I mean, if, if we can start to really tear down this, so how do you get, so why are these guys seeking so many coaching? What, what, what is good coaching really getting, where, why are these guys coming and doing this now? And versus like, and what, what do we see as good high quality coaching versus, hey, I'm just gonna go write up a workout or hey, you're just gonna go follow this website and get it done. And you know, I, I think that's the big question at hand. So pe I, I think that's something a lot well, of people are missing. And, and let me be clear, I, I think the, the conversation about that around that is, you know, has been, you're not deadlifting, you can't do pull-ups, high rep pull-ups, your snatching is terrible, you're gonna have to practice those things, right? You're gonna have to do that. Now we can say, oh great, you're doing all that, you're running your mechanics. I mean, I think you bring up this point all the time. Some of our CrossFit athletes are really good, good enough to qualify for nationals, right? Yeah. Like Katie Hogan, boom, yeah. right? She's amazing. How many athletes are are, are qualifying in the 400 meters regularly or the 100 meter sprint or a 5k or a 5k <laughs> there's I think I just think there's so much capacity to get better I'm regularly you know one of the things that Brian and I do is we give everyone that we work with or see we give them a sort of a percentage of where we think that they are in yeah. terms of deriving the maximum benefit of their training yeah right yeah. at their potential their genetic potential and I rarely see an athlete in their 90s yeah. I thought I think rich is squeaking in the 90s that means like I can get 10% better and then I, I, I would agree derive with that so that it's, and, it's and, an order of where he's change. at is a different place than where <laughs> a lot of people are at right now well I tell you <laughs> it's it is we look at the top athletes and even something we talked about is if we're seeing people repeat workouts in the open because they're like hey I, I want to be 297th in my gym not you know 305th in my gym yeah, yeah, yeah. and what we're what's really interesting is we start talking to the best athletes unless they made a real technical error they are not training for the open they are training for regionals and the games yeah you know this is just a, a part of their training volume stepping stone. in fact it's funny uh, some of the co master coaches I work with Yami Tikin and think they see this as sort of an annoyance God, this is getting in the way of the real work to be done for the games, and yeah. so uh, it's exciting. I, I think I think it's very exciting. You know, I, I I also think that the coaching thing really comes down to how you know how open an athlete really is, because if you don't have these athletes, which is something that I've dealt with and you've dealt with, where it's hey, you've got athletes who are coming to the gym, or you've got athletes that want to work with you, but how well are they willing to listen to you and your direction and what you can see from outside that forest versus inside and being in that thing and trying to do your own program, trying to do your own thing. And Aaron was a perfect experiment with that. You know, hey, look, I stepped in, I came in and said, hey, by the way, your nutrition isn't totally dialed. You should, you know, there's some, there's some minor adjustments we can make here. Are you willing to make those things? Yes. Can you, at this point, being a CrossFit Games athlete, here's something that we've, I've been talking about a lot lately is, can you have a nine to five job? Can you be at, you know, dealing with the kids and gonna go, go and compete and be at the highest level? And I'm thinking it doesn't look like that anymore. That doesn't exist. This looks like a pro I, sport. I, I call that now, that's done. Uh, well, I, I'll tell you, from I, what I think, I've seen, I think if you're a masters athlete, now we're having yeah, a conversation. Yes, the Miss, masters are, aren't you going for masters? Wait, next year? Next year, next year. Whoa. I'm not saying I'm going for Nasters next year. No, but he is saying. I see you. I'm calling it. Right. So, um, <laughs> but I, I think that really is where we've seen the professionalism of the sport. And what I think what's really fun is if you're paying attention to sort of these meta trends, we're seeing that people are really getting sophisticated about their adaptation. They're they're developing a health network that's supporting them. They're developing, you know, because they're not perfect, right? They're developing a, a cadre of coaches to get expertise, which is what every national team looks like. They're, they're developed, they have a, someone helps them with nutrition, they have support, and then you've got to 
be a professional. I really think we're not going to see someone come into the games and flash. I think you're going to have to at least been to the games once no. to make the mistakes of what's it look like to be that good that many days in a row and really explore it. And, uh, and what I think is great is that we need to be beyond the conversation of, of that was amazing, but w that wasn't amazing. How, much, how many lessons can we see? Watching Annie go against Lindsay, yeah. two extraordinary women, and really just changes in technique, changes in output, result in just a few reps here and there, such different strategies. And what I think is, if you are a clever coach in any sport, in any discipline, you can start to see those things and draw the parallels like, oh, guess what? I'm probably gonna run my 5K faster. I'm gonna, I have to do multiple soccer games. I have to, I'm doing a hike in the Grand Canyon. How do I improve my mechanics? And that's when we're all sitting here having a conversation about all this, is why we come together, is why we're sitting here with what we're doing, and we have these discussions, and we can talk, we have a lot of other coach that we, coaches that we talk to, and we have these conversations about, hey, what did we just see in that workout with Annie and Lindsay? And wow, did you see, did you see the energy cost that came with that flaw, that fundamental flaw in mechanics where this is a girl who's probably the strongest gal in, in oh. the games, but and, she's and making some fundamental and has a, movement. And has an engine as big as anyone else. I mean, Dude, just huge, a, and like, huge. And her heart. And she's going to do well, but there's there's some energy cost that's coming there and she doesn't need to have yeah. that. And I, there's just so much more potential. So much more potential. Well, so that's what we'll, as we see these meta trends coming up, you know, don't confuse volume with high quality training. Yeah. It's not, it's not a substitution which is what we've seen forever. We've seen this experiment run. What are the experiments about training with other people? You know, what are the experiments run about your nutrition? What are the experiments run? You know, that's the conversation that people need to have. When they see this thing, don't be sucked into all these other things. Be thinking, what lessons do I learn to apply this to sport and life and to other, other uh, iterations of our, uh, of our athletic selves? Couldn't agree more. And I mean, and you say it all the time. It's like when that, you, you know, you've said it and it's gonna be in your book, is when that athlete makes that decision to move that in that poor way, that they've just taken a step back in that in their ability to be an athlete. You yeah, know? and I just well, so we have. Let's talk with Christy about yeah. this. I think it's great. We also have a good mailbag today. You guys, huge. Uh, you, I, I am impressed with the way that you're starting <laughs> to see has, has the your world is half just like blown well, up. Well, I'm with, like, half broken. I see more potential leopard <laughs> fail. Like there is about twenty a day. There's <laughs> broken people, and I think it's great is that people start to understand. You know, Musashi said, "Make your combat uh -oh. stance your uh -oh. everyday stance." There, we go. there it is. There, <laughs> there is no go. difference. You know, that's why you can't just be eating pizza and Oreo balls, no, bro. You got to read books, bro. Dude, <laughs> you got to about understand. Musashi. So, well, let's talk. We'll get in the mailbag. Yeah. And we'll bring on Christy Phillips. All right, hang tough. We'll All see right, you soon. All right, guys. See you in a minute. Okay, guys. If you want to get a hold of us, you want to get more involved, here's how you're going to do it. Hit us on Facebook. Send us your best picture of the worst thing you're seeing during the week. Twitter, at GP Television. Hashtag Leopard Fail. Hashtag I See More Potential. And then, of course, hashtag GPTV. Welcome back to GPTV. We are happy and thrilled beyond belief to have the wonderful and amazing Christy Phillips join us. Um, if you don't know, you've probably seen her on ESPN. How many times have you been in the games? Four. Four. <laughs> like, I don't think I've exercised enough in one year to make up the volume that would happen in four weeks of the, the games. Now, <laughs> like a whole year, like you've done more pull-ups in eight minutes than I, I, I get to do in, in a lifetime. Um, we're, you sort of make the, the case for us You've seen the games evolve over four years, right? Last year yeah. you were? 11th. It's pretty amazing. I always feel like at the, at the end of, of competition, eventually we're gonna have 10 people stand in there, 12 people stand there, who could, any person can win it every given day. I mean, yeah. do you think that's what's happening? Oh yeah. It's like, it's like the gladiators in a ring. You put them out there and it's like fight to the, to the death. I love it. I guess. <laughs> Where were you? Where, so where were you? And the then year? we all hug and kiss afterwards. <laughs> That's so sweet, right? right? How it's much like we love each other. That's true. <laughs> and, then, and then just root each other on. And, you know, <laughs> right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. where, where were you the year before? What, how'd you finish? Um, I finished 21st. 21st. Mm -hmm. And the year before that? Six. And then the 2009, my first year, six. So six, six, 21st, and then 11th. Mm -hmm. Do you see, and I don't know if people are picking up on the pattern on that, but mm -hmm. it wasn't like you got worse, because you didn't. 
Yeah, right? the level of competition just went Changed. here to here yeah, yeah. in a matter and, of a couple years. And so there's been some fundamental, uh, maybe some fundamental changes that have been happening with you Absolutely. in the last year. Mm -hmm. um, and something that we, you know, I, I, at least I picked up on and Kelly has mentioned so far, but what you're doing, and I mean, even that you're out here in San Francisco right now, mm -hmm. looking for some other things to kind of tweak in your training, right? Yeah, I, I've been doing CrossFit for almost six years, yeah. um, but I really haven't I really truly haven't taken myself seriously as an athlete, mm -hmm. um, a CrossFit athlete, except um, until the last two years or so. What was this? What's the switch? How, I mean, you are competing legit. Mm -hmm. You're very legit, mm -hmm. and yet you don't think of yourself as like a full-time professional athlete. What was the yeah, change? Yeah, there was there had there was that change, and it was in, in about the 2010 year um, when we got we went from Aromas to Home Depot Center. Um, so we were competing there, and um, I left that year sixth place, but very, very disappointed, to be honest with you, because I had gotten sixth place in 2009. And you want to see progress every year. I thought I was going to get better. Um, and when, when I stayed the same, I realized, um, okay, I got I to do something else to, to elevate my training and elevate the, because the level of competition has elevated. Go ahead. That, yeah. That, for me, that you know, that's it's just very, it's very intriguing to hear that because mm -hmm. it's uh, there's this mental thing mm -hmm. that, that's occurred, this psychological thing that's occurred to where you are like you're not happy, and and this is what I see with a mm -hmm. lot of athletes not like you, mm -hmm. is where they continue to put themselves in the same positions and do the same things they've been doing, mm -hmm. yet they're not getting the results that they like. Which That's the definition of madness. Yes. Insanity, That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? And, doing the same thing and expecting and so, different results. Yeah. And so here, here's an, here you are, mm -hmm. who's somebody who can identify that within, in the heat of it mm -hmm. and, and be able to, and what's that, so wh what's your life like, like today? Well, like, mm -hmm. let's, let's cut that out into two pieces. First. What have been the changes between then and now? As you make this yeah. mental switch, what's changed? Yeah, so, so it is an evolution. And so from 2010, sixth place, to 2011, 21st place, um, I had to work very, very, very hard to earn that 21st place. Yeah. And so then after that year, after 2011, it was like, well, damn, now I have to work even harder because I, I got 21st place and, and I barely made it to the games in 2011. Um, I barely got third place to qualify for the game. And so finally, after, after it being in your mind, like maybe I should start taking this even more seriously. Maybe I should start um, seeking out some specialists and, and asking for help and, um, and you, looking at my resources. Were you training by yourself during these times? Um, I've, had, I've been training with CrossFit MPH with my coach Melody um, for, since 2010. Oh, yeah. um, so she's trained me through, and so has John Main, um, through three games now. Mm -hmm. um, and do they handle your program? Do you guys program handle, together? And they handle my programming, but um, it's a lot of back and forth, and um, we're all evolving together on that. And then this year was the year that I finally started seeking, and with their collaboration, seeking out people like you guys. And um, an only lifting coach in the D.C. area, Kara Heads, Olympian. <laughs> she's awesome. Actually, she's on the back cover of Becoming a Supple Leopard. I'm such a fan. Yep. She's on the back cover. Yep. So, yeah. so it's like in CrossFit, you have this amazing community. You have amazing resources. You have experts in almost every area of fitness and sport. And if we don't, if, if we haven't tapped into every sport, we will. And so um, why not take advantage and, and reach out and send an email, make a phone call or do some Googling and see how you can find them and how they can help you yeah. and, and then evolve. What was your background before you started becoming the, one of the fittest, sickest human beings I've ever met? Um, I played high school sports. I did cross country, basketball and lacrosse. And then um, I went to GW and walked onto the lacrosse team there. And that was my intro to strength and conditioning, formal, formal strength and conditioning program. And after my freshman year, I decided I didn't want to play, do wall ball and work on my stick skills. It just wasn't as interesting to me, but the strength and conditioning part was. And so I changed my major to exercise science, and then I ran and drank a lot of beer for three years. <laughs> and then... You call that the building period. <laughs> that was the building yes. years. Put on 10 pounds of beer muscle, beer weight, no beer muscle. Weight. <laughs> um, and then my senior year at GW is when I... Um, 
met Melody Feldman, met John Main. We were all working at a Globo gym as trainers there. And um, they were already very interested in functional movement and circuit training and always looking at um, different resources and how to better their, their own programming and better their coaching. And that's how they stumbled upon CrossFit and they introduced it to me. That's uh, <laughs> that's my story. Bam. <laughs> Do, what have been the changes in your nutrition in the last four years? Like what? Tell, I mean, people. What yeah. we love about this is that we get to see. So we want to see behind the scenes. Yeah. Like, what are the, what's what's the change in nutrition? How? What do you have? Do you have a plan you follow? Well, what's kind of cool is I actually I on and off have kept a workout log um, since two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine when I um, started competing. And so I looked back and at the Mid-Atlantic qualifiers to qualify you to the CrossFit Games, um, I went to IHOP on Sunday morning before the final events and had whole wheat pancakes because they were whole wheat. Yes. And I needed the energy and syrup. Well, if you, you can't win Puffy, you're nothing. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Like, win right? Puffy. Puff. Hashtag Dog. winpuffy.com. <laughs> win, win and that's puffy. that has changed, though, because uh, I, I have adopted a, a low, no gluten, less grain, um, emphasizing more meats, more vegetables, um, trying to get better starchy, better sources of carbohydrates like sweet potatoes and starchy things like that. Um, and so I do that especially leading up to competition and over the competition weekend. So I'm not taking in um, as, as much sugar in that form. It For me, I, get, I will get acid reflux. So I'm like, how did I ever eat a plate of pancakes and then do a workout. I've, you were, you're I've trained. To, well, I trained that way. I'm headed. I'm headed to Las Vegas, and we've had this discussion. I'm headed to Vegas this uh, to, tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, you will physiologically <laughs> adapt to things. Your body will attempt to do this. You cannot, yeah. you cannot and, adapt and, to and, Vegas. And if you, yeah, well, they, they adapt. They, adaptation they try. Stay in Vegas. The trolls stay in Vegas. do live in Vegas, <laughs> and they do adapt to some things out there. So it's. It, but that, I think that's the most frightening place on the planet where you can see physiological adaptation to things. <laughs> but yes, and I was there too. I mean, I used to yeah. crush pizzas myself, and yeah. you know, I was just like all part of the process. I got to. Yeah. Got to fuel the carbs. Right. Got to fill back up. Right. You know? I mean, now it's a little bit more of a balance. So I I tighten things up as it gets closer to competition. Meaning you don't um, res you don't calorie restrict. You just I don't try calorie to restrict. Cleaner. I actually try to over. I honestly try to overeat as it leads up to competition. So I try to take in more calories in the form of fat, meats, and starchy carbs. Mm. Um, at least once a week, I have dessert, if not more times a week. But yeah, well, by the matter. way, that's it, it, uh, uh, if not more. I, I would like Asterix. to hashtag that. Asterix. <laughs> I will. I will hashtag that as Star at Paleo. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Eat as clean as you can all day long. Have some dessert. Toss in dessert at night. Oreo ball. Or, I like or it. Oreo balls. It's not the limiting factor. We'll put it that way. I like it. Talk about your sleeping. So you're mm -hmm. one of the few athletes I know actually has a full time job too. Mm -hmm. Yep. How do you balance both those things? Yep, that's been a change what you, too. What do you I'm, do? Um, I'm a registered nurse. So after I got my degree in exercise science, I went back um, and got my uh, BSN. Mm -hmm. And I was working in a hospital um, doing the three 13 hour shifts a week. How fun was that? Um, it was a really good experience, and it's it's a really important place to start as a nurse. I meant it sucked. Yeah, but it's real. <laughs> it was a really good experience. Yeah, absolutely. You got great, a, a, great place to be from. I, yeah, I think yeah. experience is truly, <laughs> even as a coach or even what we do, it, yeah. experience is actually just teaches you how smart you get to be. Thirteen hours yeah. on your feet. How yeah. did your training go on either sides of that? Yeah, I I actually thought, okay, I'm gonna have four days that I can be at the gym as men, as long as I want, and it just I did not. Um, expect that it would take such a toll on me. So it, it took a, a really big uh, physical, emotional, mental toll. Um, and so I, after about eight months of doing that, I made a switch to school nursing. And so I work um, as a school nurse Monday through Friday, eight to four. It's a very unique, special place. There's no place like it. Keep going. Kirov Academy of Ballet. And um, oh. so it's a, an academy for for high school and, L and middle schoolers who are aspiring Legit. professional dancers. Dude, they're elite. If you want to use the word, if we, we like to use the word elite in CrossFit. Yeah. They're elite. They are elite. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you think, I, I have season tickets to ballet, So You Think and Dance is my favorite show. I'm, I'm proud to say it. Uh, what, do you, what do you notice? I mean, it's interesting that you're a full-time training athlete, healthcare provider there. Mm -hmm. Does that have a different relationship? The kids know how awesome you are? Do they even know? 
the, the anatomy and physiology teacher is like my promoter <laughs> at the school. So he's like, do you guys understand what, what Nurse Christy does? They call me Nurse Christy. Nurse. And so they don't care. They actually oh, don't oh, care at all. I will be wearing a Nurse Go Christy. Nurse Christy t-shirt. Yes, we, I think we That's need to create so legit. that. We need to create that. Go Nurse Christy. <laughs> awesome. Nurse Christy. What, um, so they don't, so they really don't care. The ballet dancers, they live and breathe ballet. Yeah. We live and breathe CrossFit or yeah. human movement. Yeah. They live and breathe ballet, so they don't care about that. What are you working they on? Will. What are the projects right now? Like the open, obviously you're you're killing mm -hmm. the open, you're you're slaying it. But what projects are you working on without giving away your top, you know, Nurse yeah. Christie secrets? Yeah, well, that's that's another thing I've learned in the last five, four or five years. There are no secrets. Like put it all out there. Um, so I don't really, I don't have any secrets. But in the Shh. fall, in the fall, um, I. Enlisted the help of Kara Heads. I followed an Olympic lifting program. Um, I've never done anything like that before. And so one project is Get Stronger. And now that um, it's the middle of March, um, the last month or so, it's been bring that, be bring that new strength and better Olympic lifting movement back into your CrossFit practice. Do you feel like you're ever, you're there? Does it ever feel like, I'm here, I'm arrived? Or does it just feel like it's always constant learning, changing, yeah. getting better? Yeah, it's you, I'm nowhere close to there. And the more you delve in, the more the further away you get in some ways. A lot of people come to the game for the first time. And you you've been here yeah. four years. Yeah. There's a good chance you're gonna go again. I'm Let's training right, for you're training for, train for a fifth season. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, I mean, do people can they realize how much time dedication you put in? I mean, like mm -hmm. you're gonna tell a young aspiring kid who wants to go to the games. You know, what piece of advice would you have for them? I, I, feel, I feel a little bad for the ladies out there now who join CrossFit and are aspiring to be at the games because I, felt, I feel lucky that I had the opportunity to start CrossFit as I want to get my first pull-up then I want to, then I want to, and, and that's. We're laughing that's, because I watched the Olympic Games yesterday and my mind was blown, so there we go. So, um, so try not to be overwhelmed by seeing the lifts and the progress of the people at the games who, who have been working this skill, or working all of these skills and these strengths for years, and the people that seem like they come out of nowhere and, and they, in one year or six months, they're at the games, that's because they had a, a very strong athletic background. They were elite level gymnasts. They, they were at the Olympics or at, at the Olympic trials for weightlifting. And so yeah. um, if, you're, if you're like me, if you're starting with some high school sports background um, and, uh, or you know, a global gym background, then it's gonna take years. It's gonna take some time. So yeah. give yourself six months to get a pull up or give yourself a year to, to get those basic skills and then you go from it's there. A, yeah, no, it, it's interesting. It's really cool to hear you say that because this, what we've just been talking about kind of leads back to this where people really, they see what you're doing and they mm -hmm. see how you can do it. And you, did, you did five training sessions yesterday, right? All okay. short. Yeah. And then I saw you eat and rest. Mm -hmm. Short, mm -hmm. eat and rest, short, eat and rest. I mean, that and training volume is, is not insignificant. Mm -hmm. Yet for you're sure. still but fast, you're still PR at the end of the night. Here yeah. we and are. This, and this is CrossFit vacation, yeah. and that's not, even, that's not a normal thing for me. You yeah. know, what, I do um, a two hour session um, five days a week, more so, or less. So here, so here we are, uh, five or six, six years later, mm -hmm. right? And you've evolved into the ability to do handle as much as you're handling mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people miss that whole interpretation of there's that curve that happens yeah. once we start that yeah it might seem really tough but you've got to put in those fundamentals and a lot of these things that are happening where you guys are now starting to see hell i better start working with a lot of these other experts and mm -hmm. understanding my movement in these p specific sports or other things mm -hmm. i'm doing where a lot of these other people actually have now this opportunity to where hey start working on this now, understand that curve, and it's gonna take some time. It's not something that's just going to happen overnight, and right. maybe not try and jump into as much as I'm doing right now, Yeah. right? Yeah. And, and give it the time to understand and get better. Absolutely. Because I, 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 I certainly remember when I was just doing, you know, when I was simply just doing one-a-days, I'm lucky if I get like four training sessions in a week right now mm -hmm. with my schedule, but 
I remember I was doing one a days, and I remember I had a sub three minute Fran. I remember yeah. I had a smoke and fast Diane time. I remember my 400s were under one minute. Yeah, yeah. I remember a 5K that was at 18 minutes, and I was doing like one workout a day. But that's kind There's of progress. There's a lot of progress that you can make in Abs one workout and a day. Absolutely. But, and then it letting it evolve to where, hey, I can handle multiple training sessions mm -hmm. in a day at this point, mm -hmm. focusing on these things. I could not handle two hard hours of training. Your hour, that's, is that a pretty dense block, two hours? You got a lot of work to do in two hours? I try to get that, yes, get in as much as I can in that time. Mm -hmm. No, not with our schedules yeah. right now. There's yeah. no way. <laughs> well, yeah, where's they, Kelly? He's asleep on the barbell. Yeah, the advantage yeah, yeah. to starting CrossFit now with, with games aspirations or not, the advantage to starting it now is there is so much more of, a, of an awareness on what's good movement, what's good form. Yeah. Um, and the experts are, are out there and you got people like you, you, you have mobility wide, you have CrossFit endurance, those mm -hmm. things you, you guys were, they were just being born or, you know, yeah. twinkle in your eye yeah. in 05, 06, 07. And so that's the advantage that the people starting have, but then the disadvantage is to um, jump in too fast and try too much volume and um, try to skip some steps. Yeah. And you what, you're like 39, 45? Probably like 72 years old. <laughs> and, 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 how, and how tall are you? <laughs> right, so. 5'10"? 27, <laughs> 27, I'll be 28 before the game. Right, so, okay. I mean, you've got this running start. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I honestly, this year's, the, especially in the women, mm -hmm. I cannot wait. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, like, just dumping no. a bag of tigers into a cage, <laughs> and like, I think like, it's gonna be amazing. This is, mm -hmm. Yeah, that brings up another good point, is I think the women have just evolved mm -hmm. in such a way. There are so many women that it is just like, it's a crapshoot. Like, you guys mm -hmm. are gonna be going at it. Like a bunch of fighting lions I, this I year. Don't even, yeah. I mean, because uh, I, I, I think people got so much better. I mean, gym culture has changed, so it's cool and fun for the ladies to hang out in the gym and um, and and collaborate. And we have we have a community, we have a support system. And I think yeah. in the past, or when you know, when it was more of like a meathead or bodybuilding, or you know, it was more like this little um, subculture of women that are that are. Yeah. Gym rats, but yeah. now it's not. Now it's like yeah, it's yes, cool so for everybody. You, you were training with Katie Hogan. Uh, you had uh, Sarah. Sarah Hopping, mm -hmm. and the three of you guys were just Olympic lifting. Mm -hmm. Diane was kind of watching. We had a couple people come in. Now you, none of you guys trained together. Mm -hmm. You're friends, and that you could just come together and did it feel weird and competitive, and people were trying to rip you off. What's that? No, it looked that like great. I looked. I was generally jealous. Yeah. Like you guys were having so much fun. The people I was meeting with were mind blown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this week has been really cool and reminding me, you know, all it takes is you just send a, send a message and say, hi friend, you, I've seen you at, you know, we've talked at the games or we've, we've crossed paths multiple times, let's, let's meet up and, and work out and collaborate. Or I think there's also this other unique thing about you, because I've, I've no, I not only heard about it, but I, I got to witness it this morning, mm -hmm. um, where Erin came home on, on uh, Monday and mm -hmm. said, uh, she was like, dude, Christy Phillips took my class today. Bam. She's like, I got to coach her. This is Erin. Erin Kafaro, yeah, yeah, gold she, medal, no, Olympic no, no, gold medal. Literally, medalist. she was so stoked. <laughs> no, but she was so stoked on it. I'm like, wait, she took your regular class? She goes, yes. <laughs> and then I showed up this morning before we shot, and here you were just getting it on with everybody. And you are, in, and, and I, I don't know how many girls or how mm. many people are actually doing that, but I don't see that as often with you guys. Mm. But I did see that out in, uh, Graceland, mm -hmm. <laughs> where the boys out there are actually doing classes with everybody and getting involved, and they're yeah. still involved in that grassroots level, and people get to see. Do you know how cool that is to have somebody like you who works as hard as you do and moves as well as you do, and people get to come into a class and coaches get to see that and get to work with it. that and, and see yeah. that? And that is a huge, huge testament to who you are as not only a human being, but as an athlete and being humble. I and appreciate it. Well, no, I, it, it. I take it for my own benefit. I mean, you're, I'm getting but the, why some of the that's best That's how you see it. On me. And that's amazing. That's that, so cool to see. I totally agree. Everyone who's run into this week has been like, that girl, she can learn. She's humble. She understands. No, there was a bunch of us standing back. And people were like, who is that freak out there in that class? And I'm like, oh, girl, this girl. This some DC some chick. <laughs> so getting to know you. And that leads us to the place where we're going to ask you some questions. Okay. Yeah. I've already done <laughs> All right. You ready we, for this? All, all, okay. We've decided that this is like Bernard Pivot. Here we go. Ready? Deep Hold breath. On, tight. Deep breath. Knees out. You are on camera. Knees out. <laughs> Knees out. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. What are you afraid of? The top of the rope climb. 
That's it. I'm just saying the first thing that comes. What, to you, what are you afraid of out of anything? Biggest thing, biggest Top fear in life. Top. Biggest that's fear legit. in life. Do you hear that? Okay. Because that scares me. Biggest <laughs> fear in life. Top of the 25 foot rope climb. Biggest fear in life. I'll hold it. I'll take it. We'll take it. We'll take being, it. Top of the twenty-five feet. Being a people. <laughs> wow. Love it. Uh, because, no. That, you know, hey, like you know what? You that nice, just that nice, just opened up. Nice, and then that really just you lose no, your that patient. just really just o- from where we were just at with uh-huh. that you doing classes and all that stuff that just kind of opened up the whole thing. So that makes a lot of being sense. being a jerk to someone at the top of rope climb. That's tough, isn't it? <laughs> yes. What's your last meal on earth? This just popped in my head too, but chicken and waffles. <laughs> DC, Dude, nurse, I love DC yes. had DC um, area um, has some really good chicken and waffles. Popeyes, too, right? you, 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 no, I don't go that low, <laughs> but fa- Founding Farmers has um, is a restaurant in DC of like local organic chicken and waffles. <laughs> local, wow. um, so I'd local have to say organic chicken and I lo- waffles. I just love breakfast food. But then you get the chicken, so if it was a last meal, you want to combine nice. it and you get All sweet right. and salty. Great. Yeah. Who's your hero? Tiny Wagner. <laughs> Dude, nice. <laughs> Solid hero. I'm, like I said, okay. on the top of the head, but she, yeah. Okay. Listen, she, go, she had a plan. She was like, I want to win the 2009 games, and then I want to have a baby. And she just executed. <laughs> like, think about that. See your future. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't be your future. The hormone system was too off for that one. <laughs> don't look where you don't want to go. So, I like, totally agree. This is her plan. Oh, and then she's question. like, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on the, te- on the, uh, the games uh, for a team. <laughs> Who's going to win the CrossFit Games men? Ben Smith. Oh, he's a monster. <sighs> Solid play. Good Solid play. You can't. All right. You want to give her the big, hard, hard heavy duty? They recently go. chose a new South American pope. Do you think that that is a decision by the papacy and diocese to try to kind of reconcile sort of the changing face of the Catholic uh, Church? Well, Jesuit, Argentinian. I'll just keep saying words. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, Christy Phillips, so Boom. stoked. Thank Very you nice. so much, Thank dude. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was rad. Hey, welcome back to GPTV. We are so stoked to have in the house, or with the gym. The gym. Which is more gym. appropriate, the lovely, the amazing Katie Hogan. Oh. Uh, you probably know Katie because, well, she's right now everywhere. She's sort of the everywhere girl. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, we were obviously brought Katie on because she sort of typifies what we're doing right now and sort of talking about the margins of performance and the margins of being ready for all these other things. And then we can talk about the projects you're going on. Right? right Welcome cool. to the show. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I think is interesting right now is we are right in the middle of the CrossFit Open, yes. which is fantastic. Oh, yeah. Now, <clears throat> I'm a physical therapist as a side effect. And one of the things, side effect, right, of being a gym owner, <laughs> and one of the things that happens <laughs> is that people complain bitterly of the wall balls from this last workout. What? It's going up Who's and down. Who's complaining fact, about that? In fact, if stop, I push Brian's stop, leg, stop. Do you see, we're still complaining <laughs> bitterly of the wall balls. Wow. You'll notice that he's actually not using his legs. No. <laughs> there's, a, there's this great piece in, um, that people talk about, they're like, Will, you can't squat. Can you get up off the ground without a squat? Prove it. And I'm, actually, you can. It's called Gower's sign. And that when kids have muscular dystrophy, they can't flex their quads, and you just lock out your legs, and you can totally get up off the yeah. ground. Yes, Sound I've been walking with stiff legs for the last two days. I've actually, I've gotten a little yeah, normal. It's a technical term. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> My brain. I'm a so, little quaddy. So right here's now. the deal. Some of you guys were a little bit sore, but what we're, it's interesting is that part of the experiment that you've been engaged with is finding out all the things that you can do around this, even while you're in the middle of the open. Yeah. What did you do one day later after the open? I decided to do a powerlifting meet. Oh, what? How'd yeah. that work out? It was great. Yeah. <laughs> I was able to PR all my lifts and get an elite total. Whoa. I know, right? Whoa. This is why I'm like, Who knew? if I was only born a woman, I could, uh, <laughs> Katie, Fuck. that's amazing. Yeah. Um, did you, good. did you, uh, what were your lifts? Uh, so I squatted 308 and I benched 203 and then I deadlift 385. Three, well, that's weird. I deadlift 386. That's, <laughs> that's really convenient. That would beat you by one pound. That's so great. Now you, you also, in this little window yes. of training for the Open, mm. going for the regionals, because you you always make it to regionals, right? I have in the past. You yeah. have in the past. <laughs> in <laughs> the most competitive yeah, female always in environment Southern California. that exists within... So they say. Yes. I would <laughs> say that this now is a... You're, honestly, your training partners, so the people that know, who are your training partners? Trisha name dropping, Kristen Clever, Becca oh. Voigt, Lindsay Valenzuela, those, those people. You guys are monsters. Yeah. So you go to the regionals, 
You also were just at the uh, Arnold. Yeah, I got what? to go to the Arnold, and for funsies, we did the Olympic weightlifting competition there. <laughs> funsies. Yes. So nothing like uh, how'd, <laughs> how'd that? How'd you do with that? Uh, I was pretty good. I PR'd my squat clean uh, with 220, which is good. My snatch was a little nerve wracking, but I, I got under 155, which is pretty okay for me. So it's a whole different thing being up there compared to CrossFit. What'd you What'd you think uh, of the Arnold? Oh, that was just insane. The amount of people and this, it was a whole spectacle there. So that was pretty cool. How, how is the Olympic lifting different than, than how you train? I don't understand. What do you mean back up? Well, yeah. uh, it's different than how you compete. Well, it's completely different than how you train because competing to me is completely different. You know, stakes are high and um, I'm, I am a different performer in the gym than I am um, on the platform or competing. Um, in this case, it was different than anything I'd ever done because it's you're up on a stage you're like elevated above the crowd the entire crowd stretches all the way out the door is kind of lights l lights down kind of dark and the spotlights are all on you and uh it's dead quiet and they're like and katie hogan on the bar i'm like oh my god you look around for katie hogan Where, yeah who is so this i had to like hogan? run up there and i'm just like smiling like a geek and <laughs> do my lifts but it's fun it's just a little nerve-wracking. Does that sort of experience where you get to go out and be uncomfortable again in a different format, do you think that plays into being a better athlete? Oh, it, to it totally translates. I mean, it gives me confidence as a competitor, and um, it shows me what I need to work on in the gym when I go back the next day. Now, so where, where did your athletic career begin? Um, I started, uh, for the most part, my um, athletic career was in volleyball. Mm -hmm. Volleyball and track and field. And I'm aware of this, but right. you know, um, the, the rest of the people, the rest of the people out here are are not. And, right. And so volleyball you, you, and track and field in college, school? at UC San Diego. You're at UC San Diego. Mm -hmm. You're an all-American volleyball player. Yes. We talked about this before on Mobility Watch. Right. And you managed in the last year. You threw this thing called the shot put. Threw in a little shot and javelin and got all-American honors in the shot just for fun. <laughs> so, what's interesting is one of the conversations we're having is how do you develop athleticism? Right. Right. Do you think? Being how this is two two part question. The first is how is that training it as an athlete, hand eye coordination, jumping, cutting. How does that translate into being a better CrossFit athlete? Right. So I think it's really interesting to see. Uh, you know, and I can think back to athletes that I played volleyball with and athletes that I watched in um, the track and field team. And actually, it was more so on the volleyball team where you would see these athletes and their you know top NC two A athletes doing well in their sport, but they're lacking certain athletic athletic traits. So, you know, some of them. We, our coach would be yelling at them to remember to breathe. Um, simple things that you don't even have to think about. Um, in track and field, I think it was a little more, you saw athleticism was a little more apparent. Um, but in, on the volleyball team, some people struggled with certain coordination and um, didn't have the same, I don't know, maybe motor patterns. They could do well in their own sport, and then we'd go in the weight room, and it was just a complete mess. They just didn't know how to do that. Um, I think... Being a well-rounded athlete my entire life, learning weight training from an early age, and um, doing various sports, I've had an athletic base, and I've more struggled in the specifics of certain sports. So mm. in dialing in Olympic weightlifting, I can find a lot of um, technical issues. Dialing in gymnastics, I can find technical issues. But as a whole, I've been able to get by in CrossFit on being an athlete. Well, uh, so, okay, so it helps. We clearly want to develop some athleticism somehow. Right. Playing different sports. It sounds like you're still playing different sports, which yes. is fun, right? And then recently you went back and just like threw the shot put and even played some volleyball. What happened? Yeah, yeah also a couple of years ago, just for fun, after doing CrossFit for three years or so, I was like, you know, in the area. I called up my track coach and went by and was able to throw the shot a bit. And he was just couldn't believe that I was throwing three feet over you know, my national qualifying record that I had. And he was just like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't even held a shot in, you know, four years. Wall balls, obviously. Yeah, it was just wall balls and muzzle yeah. <laughs> So that was really exciting to see that without practicing the shot at all, it was able to go further. And then um, I got to play volleyball last night um, with a high school club team just for fun, just like some scrimmage pickup games. And, um, of course, I'm not going to say that I'm at the level I was at no. on the technical side of things, but my vertical's fine, my conditioning's fine, I'm running around the court, we're hitting rallies, and my power is behind the, the hits the same as they were. So fun to be able to use that at now 30 years old when I played when I was 20. I've watched, because uh, I, I got to work with you a couple years ago, and then I've watched, I, I watched you compete this year, 
um, at the at the Orange County Throwdown, mm -hmm. and you know one of the th one of the things that I've seen is this is this change in your positions, and mm. a lot of the things that we talk about yeah. was a lot of this stuff that you have really changed, and and it, it's been pretty cool to see because we this sport has not got well, CrossFit has not gotten easier, right? Right, so it, it's only gotten tougher, 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 and here you are. Probably one of the, you know, it being in the competitive environment that you're in in Southern Cal, that you've been in in Southern California, and you've stayed at the top. And I mean, it's just been, it's been a really cool thing to watch and how you've changed that and seeing you compete at that level with that. And do you think that's really trans helped transition a lot of that stuff that you've been going back and throwing the shot put or even finding these positions, even within volleyball, mm -hmm. it's like, whoa, wow, maybe my knees not diving in was, yeah. oh, whoa, I find stability here and mm -hmm. I've still got a big vertical. And, you know, these things that we see will, people question, uh, you know, the questions we see are, oh, well, what if you were to retrain RG3? Would he still have that same 39 and a half foot vertical? But, right. you know, you're somebody who probably was doing a lot of that stuff back then. Right. But are finding better positions now. Now I'm doing it better. Yeah, yeah. exactly. An interesting piece about you is that you are pretty injury proof. Yeah. Touch wood. Yes, please, but, uh, thank you. That's right, but <laughs> you, I mean, I think what's interesting is that you're, you've made, really made a commitment in the last couple of years that we've known each other. Yeah. Your positions are better, you're, you're, you're more stable, and, and you're able to just sort of map on that this basic athleticism with basic, uh, your skills are getting better. Right. And it, it also correlates into that you don't kind of get sidestepped by these things. Yeah, no, yeah. there hasn't been much that um, has got me off track. And even just talking about pieces like recovery and learning what's best for my body is to keep moving. So I do, you know, in addition to a lot of the drills that you've worked on with me and um, holding good positions when I am training, it's good for me to know that after a powerlifting meet, knowing that I have a week of the CrossFit Open coming ahead of me, I need to get out and go on a jog the next day. That right when I don't want to, when my back's starting to tighten up and hamstrings are getting tight, if I go on a couple mile run and then come in, smash a little bit, I'm perfectly fine the next day to show up and lift and train hard for CrossFit. And you know what, you and Jesse came up with a new term. It's like Metcon. Right. But it's for mobility. It's called SmashCon. SmashCon, yes. It's a SmashCon. So he We're texts me, you oh. need to go run and do a SmashCon. And it's two to three mobility exercises. Bam! SmashCon. Smash apart. You heard it here first. So, so, I love it. That is Two my, to three rounds. Two to three rounds. <laughs> it's a, or an AMRAP, and, whatever you can it. do. The run at the Orange County Throwdown. Mm -hmm. It was a run. It was a sandbag. It was a run. Yeah. How did you do on that? Run. Oh my gosh. So that was when they posted that. They were like, "Oh, it's gonna be a seven k run." I was like, "Well, I'm out. There's a time cap. I'm the big girl. It's not gonna happen." How do you compare in size to the rest of the you girls? You wish you were bigger. Much bigger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I say I'm. I always say that I'm about thirty pounds at least over the average CrossFit competitor. Yeah. I don't know if that's an exaggeration or what, but. Um, I did great because then there was a heavy sandbag and girls were getting crushed and I just <laughs> like a little tractor just plowed right past them. It was awesome. So um, I was really proud with that and um, I don't know what I finished in that. I think somewhere in the in the top 20 or so, yeah. I think, or yeah. somewhere up there. We see that in our nascent strength and conditioning sport, and it's really the strength and conditioning as a sport, strength and conditioning as a field has really evolved recently. But one of the things I don't think we're doing the best job of is looking around and seeing all of the other sports and taking what we can so we don't have to run that experiment again because right. this is also nascent, yeah. right? So, yeah. so, um, so evolving, emerging. You guys at Valley, for example, came mm. up early that you realized that like I needed strong training partners, that training together or training mm. in an environment where people work together is a lot what the best athletes in the world do. They have training camps, they go live together. Right. Okay, so you guys were on that early because we're starting to see that happen more and more. Oh, oh yeah, this is the way every other team works. Mm -hmm. What other things have you seen in since your involvement in the CrossFit relative to the training? Right. How how have we evolved in the last say three years, for example? Well, I think you know a lot of people have been researching things outside of just what shows up on CrossFit Main Site, which is a great resource for CrossFitters, I think, and I find excellent training up there. Absolutely. But I think um, what we started doing was supplementing strength programs, right? The strength bias. There's a lot of things on CrossFit.com that talk about that. Um, training your weaknesses. Um, in my case, it would be doing skill-specific training with Olympic lifting specialists, with gymnastics specialists. Um, and getting to incorporate that stuff so into warm-ups, cool Finding other cool coaches exactly. who aren't your primary coaches, exactly. but still looking for a, what, what going about? Going to the people that are experts in their relative area. I mean, I'm 
I'm gonna go to the strong people to tell me how to get strong. I'm gonna go to the people that know how to do specific movements the best if I'm having if I'm struggling with those. Do you uh, like if we looked at nutrition, how the those things we clearly have seen we've got a little more sophisticated. Oh yeah. Um, what about training volumes? Are you working more hard or less hard than you were three years ago? Well, I think it's um, it's I feel like I'm working smarter. I don't know if it's harder or um, or less hard, <laughs> but um, it's I'm much smarter about how my week is programmed out and about what goes into it. Can you it. give us an example? Um, so in the past, it was kind of like, okay, we have to get in all four of these lifts. You know, if we were following like a Wendler program or something, we were saying mm -hmm. we have to max out our deadlift, we have to max out our squat, we have to max out our press and our bed. Maybe, I, I can't even remember. But if I'm thinking back to like 2009, I think Becca and I would try to get in four heavy lifts a week. And um, then on top of that, we would just try to throw in little extras that were weaknesses, maybe handstands, something like that, but it wasn't as organized as now I have an entire list of accessory work with rounds, rep counts that are progressive each week. So I can see, okay, I was doing this many sets of strict pull-ups or strict dips. Ne next week I wanna be here and uh, check them off the list as the week goes on. And you know, my strength program has been refined, so it's a lot closer to um, you know, what a lot of power lifters do, where it's not just about more, 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 but smart, you know, mix up your lifts, change things up with um, different types of resistance training and um, bands, chains, different bars, things like that, instead of just max out your squat again, max out your squat again, right. max out your squat again, and my body's responding much better to that. Do you think people are in for a rude shock when they all of a sudden they're all regional, like I am so good at wall balls and double unders and then I go to regions, is that, is that gonna shock people? I mean it did last year. I remember <laughs> coming and watching the Northern California region and watching girls tear their arms off of the 70 pound dumbbell, so that would be a shame. Do you, do you remember, uh, did you ever see uh, the All Drug Olympics? Where uh, Jim Belushi like, you know, he yes, just yes, rips yes. his arms off? Right? And his arms come off. Or it was Joe, Joe Pesci, do you remember? Yeah, yeah, Joe yeah, Piscopo? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, yeah, 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 that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember that's that too. What was happening? Yeah. So, so that would be a shame, I would say, if we were um, kind of getting a certain athlete in and then we shock them with um, things that they they can't handle. I don't I don't put that on CrossFit by no, any means. No, no, no. It's but it's hard to sort of because yeah. I know you struggle personally with mm -hmm. some of the other lighter side. You yeah. know what the games look like. Right. You know what the volume looks like. You know what regions right. look like. And then also getting there is is a dual piece. Yeah. And it? I'm not yeah. going to train or not going to change the type of athlete I am. I I am going to work on body weight movements. Um, you know longer metcons, I'm going to work on burpees and things like that, but I'm not going to, uh, I'm not trying to cut weight. I'm not trying to turn myself into a 150 pound metcon thing. I'm trying to stay strong and get better in those other areas. Right. How, how much are you paying attention to the recovery of this and, and, and your body now? Versus, week to week in the yeah, open? Yeah. Um, that's a, a big part of it. I, I sometimes do the workouts twice. I have, I don't think, think there's anything wrong with that. I've never done them more than twice, but I've paced it out on one day and then reattempted it later in the week. And so, yeah, recovery is a big part of that. But I can't do days off in between the Open. I need to train through that. Yeah. Um, every year that the Open has existed, we've, you know, whoever my training partners and coaches are, we'd always agree, you train through the Open. You don't put things yeah. on hold and, okay, rest day before, you know. We do things like... Um, you have to be. You have to be trained for right. the big game. I dial my nutrition in and my sleep and recovery, especially knowing that the Open workout, I will do it on this day then that means the night before my meal is going to reflect that I'm getting up in the morning to do the open workout. Yeah. Same as I would the yeah. night before a competition. There you go. So that's where I, I'll make sure, just pay special attention. But other than that, I mean, staying on you know, my sleep, staying on my hydration, that's really what it is. That's great. Three questions. What are you afraid of? Sharks. Everyone knows that. Wow. Terrified. Yeah. yeah. Really? Oh yeah, I don't go in the ocean. What, really? The only, only time I went in the ocean. My brother, my, my You my were sister. there. Yeah. When I had to oh, go yeah, in the yeah, ocean yeah, yeah, for yeah, yeah, the 2011 yeah, yeah. games, I was a complete wreck. My, uh, my, my sister-in-law, is ex she won't even touch the ocean. Yeah. I don't. I ran, I ran into them with just all I knew is that I wanted to be in the Home Depot Center. And if I didn't go in the ocean right then, I wouldn't yeah. get to. Uh, Unbelievable. Shark. So if I'm trying to beat you as a competitor, just and like, I just dunk, I, like I throw a shark at you. Or a land like, shark? I'm like, <laughs> like, right in the moment, I'm like, raise your butt to lift. I'm like, shark. I, that, PR. 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 Shark PR! Okay, uh, what's your last meal on earth? My what? What's your last meal on earth? Something with chocolate and peanut butter in it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Straight up. Yeah. That's the fastest anyone has answered that to date. That's I mean, impressive. That is fairly fast. <laughs> Who's your hero? Oh, um, that's tough. Oh. 
Who's my hero? Chocolate or? peanut butter. Who's your hero? <laughs> 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 Me? Wow. Um, I don't know. You know, that's that's tough. Um, I'm a very family oriented person, so um, my first instinct is to think of my parents. And uh, when I think in relation to athleticism, my dad has been a huge um, person for me to look towards and kind of le has always led by example. Um, I just I have a really strong bond with my entire family, and my dad has just kind of been this image of just persevering through um, his own athletic uh, endeavors in, in the past. And growing up as a kid, seeing that, that's definitely been someone that I've tried to emulate. All right, last one. Where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> that's the one I always get. I don't know. <laughs> Where do I see myself? I see myself surrounded by family and friends, fit, hey. healthy, competing in something. Yeah. I don't okay. know that I'll still be competing in CrossFit. No sharks. Which seems to no shock sharks. a lot of people. Peanut butter. Peanut butter. <laughs> Dead, Competing. Knee deep in Reese's. And <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Katie Hogan, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Welcome back to GPTV. Here we are at the mailbox. And we have had more pictures, more information thrown at us on what can we solve. And, All right. Uh, so let's get into it because there's so much. We want to make sure we always leave in a big chunk of time. We could probably figure out, we could do a whole show around questions about from, from the bright kids in the world. Let's start with V10 from Rochester, New York. Hey guys, you often talk about how bad it is to walk with your toes pointing out, uh, only obsessively all the time. Do I obsess about it and talk about it? Even my seven-year-old daughter will quiz me and she says things like, hey dad, what's wrong with my standing? I'm like, I don't know, Georgia, you, you stand like a duck? She's like, obviously, and I'm overextended. So if uh, my seven-year-old can get it, then I know you can get it, right? And, uh, but the real question here is, what about people who walk with toes slightly pointed in? Is that bad too? Well, so if your wheels, let's just go for the car analogy. If your wheels of your car were turned in, would this cause you problems in the long haul? <laughs> right. So I think where people get confused is that, you know, if I'm jerking, for example, and I have that front foot turned in, that allows me to access my hip torsion and create a more stable system earlier without having to go so far out, right? So Correct. this position, which is exactly the position people skate in, Exactly position people surf in, snowboard, which is exactly this kind of this high torque iteration. Yeah, I'm blocked at full ankle flexion in that position, and that's really the question. Is as I'm walking, my toes turned in, my ankle is no longer walking like an ankle. And when we start talking about what's happening upstream, we'll see that there's a couple patterns that people have. Oftentimes, in this extremely rotated position, where the ankle is valgus and the knee is valgus and collapse, and I'm overextended, I can hang there. Well, people have also figured out that if I go internally, then I can actually access and hang in a neutral pelvis, but I'm hanging on the Y ligaments. And so you'll see people who uh, have a lot of what we call genuine recurvatum, they're, they're hang on their knees, they internally rotate, and then just can hang on the, the Y ligaments here. And so what you're seeing is that people have figured out mechanically, and you can even see this when you sit down, watch what you do with your feet. A lot of people will turn their feet in when they sit because it creates that block. Fundamentally, what we're seeing is a disorganized pelvis, and that there's a couple patterns again that emerge, and that we see this pattern overextension turned out, and then we'll see kids with their legs in, feet straight, and again we have to usually talk about looking at the pelvis. So the first thing I do is to say, look, what's really going on with the pelvis, and then you got to get back and organize in this position. You cannot walk your feet straight. Check out women who are wearing high heels. You know, they'll be like and they'll just drop into their little internally rotated position. It allows them to get out of that extension. The same way the knee comes in when I'm short, this is a, allows me to kind of break that long pattern. Otherwise, the, the extension forces on the back are bad. They've figured out another mechanical block so they can do less work. Look, standing, positioning mechanics, it's all about right tension. When people don't understand is that if I lay on my back, my legs always fall out, right? You're, at the, you're sunning, tanning yourself yeah. by the pool. Legs fall out. And one of the things that people ask me as a therapist is, hey, can you fix that? And I'm like, actually, you don't want me to fix that. <laughs> because your fascia actually has these kind of uh, ripples in it. And what ends up happening is that the, 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 the fascia, the connect tissue of the body, has this ripple so that when you bring your foot straight, you automatically create passive torsion through the system, which makes the st hip stable. And what you, people have done is they've just gone ahead and gone into that and they can, don't, I don't have to work anymore, I can just hang on the joints. So it's just another way. It's absolutely an error. And unless you want to look like one of those robots you're running. You're a meat hanger? You're a meat hanger. Of course, that's just my opinion. Oh. I could be wrong. I'm not wrong. Going deep. What's our second question, bro? Second question <laughs> comes from um, Brandland. 
um, he was talking about um, you know leg length discrepancy, which is a, a little bit of a technical question. Um, he says, "Hey, look, you know my pelvis is off, and it's from a leg length discrepancy. We know that every once in a while someone's legs will grow longer or shorter. A bad injury as a kid, we'll see some something happen. Yeah. When when we're serious about that, we'll actually measure it on radiograph. The physician will measure that on X-ray." And we can really look at the length of your femurs and the length of your tibia. And those, we do see differences. The human body has enough kind of mechanics in it to, and enough slop in it to go ahead and correct some of those physiologic changes that we see regularly. So, you, you know, and a physio is like, eh, we can go upwards of a centimeter and a half. Maybe you can buffer those things. We absolutely do see when people have one leg that's different or some mechanics that are different. That, and that's a problem. Most of the time, we're not talking about the global system. And what I'm always asking you to do is, hey, look upstream and downstream. If your foot is turned out more, the ankle is collapsed more, I'm functionally shorter. I believe that. If I'm ha- always like this, standing, well, one of the things that happens is that my hip ends up with this natural rotation. The tissues start to be adaptively short. And then guess what happens? It looks like my leg is short, but it's really not. That my pelvis is in a bad position, I'm rotated, my foot is collapsed. In fact, I sprained my ankle really bad as a kid. Iced it a ton. Can you imagine how that worked out for me? And uh, Mr. Anti-Eyes. I know. <laughs> and uh, what ends up happening is that when I get this foot measured, my right foot is actually w- wider than my left foot because this ankle was, and foot was so collapsed. When you found me, yes. my feet were pretty weak, and it took me a while to get my feet back on. Found him. You know, and one of the, this brings up an interesting point of athletes that I've worked with in the past because I've worked with several amputee athletes and thing, and people of this nature who will have fundamentally, I mean, they're structurally, there just That's is right. something missing. Oh, and we, athletes, yeah, totally. We're totally, uh, these are adaptive athletes. And from everything I've seen, and I've really, I've honestly had my hands on four or five of them. And, and there's just really, once the, mechanics are really understood there's really not a problem and if they're actually moving in these functional ways that we talk about if they're mobile enough and if they can get into these positions like let's say a squat let's say a deadlift let's say pressing you know these weird places we're going um, that we tend to see these issues start to fix themselves they do they really do attenuate you still have to move correctly and when we do see a functional change ultimately yeah, we might need a shim. I see it one in, uh, I'm going to say 500 people who present to me with a leg length discrepancy actually have a leg length discrepancy. And it's one in 500, you know, which is a high percentage. And then what ends up happening is that we deal with that. And then we also deal with compromise. We know some tissues are going to get shorter because that leg's shorter. Yeah. If you know what's coming down the pipeline, expect expected. Yeah, just like me. If I'm compensating somewhere, I'm just going to start making up for it and start peeing on fire, fire hydrants. Hi. Hi. So, third question from Yasmin. She actually is at uh, San Francisco CrossFit. Can you effectively fuel, including hydration, for a 6 a.m. workout without having to get up at 4.30 a.m. or thereabouts to eat? Let me, let me take the first crack at this, because this is really your wheelhouse. Yeah. First is, are you committed or not? I mean, that's really the question. And I think, you know, you need to, like, make a decision. If you need to get up at 2 in the morning and eat a chicken, maybe you need to do that. I'm just saying. You want to be a super athlete, yet you want to work a nine to five job, so you've got to get up for a six a.m. workout. Honestly, how do we? Honestly, do that? what are you gonna do? No, um, honestly, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going. I'm somebody who can actually eat food before I train. Um, probably up to about thirty minutes, solid food. Um, Give I, me an example. Like what? Eggs, bacon, avocado, some berries. Bacon. I can, yeah, bacon. Yeah, yeah. I can actually. I, I would be able to handle something like that. Typically with any type of workout. Um, yeah, and you know, I will say egg, uh, a handful of berries. Because how yeah. much food do I really need? No, yeah, right. You're just breaking a fast and you just need to get your body moving and your body, you need to get something in your gut to say, hey, what? here we go. But what typically the things that I, I see that I would avoid are high sugar things because it, that's where you're going to set yourself into. You're already in a fasting state. You're now coming into a workout that you've just stuck sugar in the system. How long have you had that sugar in the system and are you already crashing? Because that's the, that's the rapacious cycle of that sugar versus having something where you're in that fasted state, your body's already burning fat, right? And we want to now stick fuel in there and continue to tell it to do that thing. So you would argue maybe more protein and fat and less carbohydrate? Or not not carb- necessarily less carbohydrate, just things that are, are going to have a lot of sugar in them. 
Be, so avoid the high avoid sugar. the high sugar. I shouldn't eat three bananas. If you can't, yeah, exactly right. Or unless you're a fruitarian and that is your staple diet, uh, which I'd love to see the the inevitable of the long term on the fruitarian. That's fine. But that's fine. It, that's fine. Uh, at any rate, my solution for that actually, and and this is a biased opinion and why I created three fuel, but that was one of the other reasons is it's a pre fuel setup to where we're dealing. We've got a protein. We've got a resistant so, some whey. starch. You got some whey in there. Some some grass. Said whey, high, high quality whey. You've got some coconut milk or Co like baby coconut milk, which is setting up for the uh, medium chain fats. So you've got a protein fat and then a uh, starch in there that doesn't necessarily spike my insulin. So yeah. if I had to make my own thing, a handful of berries, some coconut milk, maybe a little protein? Maybe. Maybe. Sounds right familiar. Where, where, where there is a will, there is a way. How many calories do you think I need? If I'm going to do, say, if this is the average CrossFitter, I'm going to go train for an hour. 100 calories, 200 calories, 300 calories? A couple hundred calories is just fine or under. It doesn't matter. The but, fact, the point, but what will be important if you're going to be doing these types of early morning workouts is what you're going to be doing after or did you get enough before, right? There it is. There it is. Uh, I also would say chug some water. Get your kidneys going right yeah, away. So, absolutely. I mean, like that, Wa water would be difference. imperative. When mo most people are waking up and they're just chugging coffee like I am, but I know if I'm going to actually do something, if I'm going to train, I am drinking water. Would you talk about the Bulletproof coffee? Could I, if I added coconut oil and some butter and cream to my coffee? Well, that was, that then, is good, but, could I, I, but well, I've I actually found to, a better rendition for this. Oh, do tell. Cacao butter. <laughs> you can get it at Whole Foods or you could order it from Amazon, I think. And that coupled with the coconut oil uh, in the coffee is, it, it tastes like a chocolate mix, but there's no sugar. It's just we, the fat. We should do a whole show about food, right? <laughs> Greek yogurt. We've got uh, Oreo balls, we've, we've got calf pudding. Yeah, e calf pudding, and now we've got cacao butter, bulletproof coffee. You didn't know, but coffee. Brian McKenzie's <laughs> coat is so shiny. You can't even believe how shiny his coat is right now. All right, perfect. All right, so I think that, that gives us a good idea. Idea is, hey, I should probably really think about having something in my stomach and find the thing, because you don't need to bro, change that every on, single day. It needs to be like, I could have five blueberries, a little snack. If that works for me, dude, don't mess with it. Have a, have a freaking plan, and it comes right back to this. Are you committed, okay? It's, it comes back right to what you're saying. If, you, if you're not committed to this, what do you do? Why are you questioning it? Why, do you, why are you having re, or doubts or even reasons for not fueling before you need to train? Well, I tell you what, in our gym, I have to have this conversation with my athletes all the time. I'm like, are you ready for my class? Yes. Because I'm about to whoop ass. Unleash. Unleash. Musashi on I'm you. I'm like, you've been awake for five minutes and we're planning on heavy cleans in the next 10 minutes. Like. Are you ready for my class? Because I don't want to spend my class getting you ready for my class. You should be sweating all night. I'm going to Kelly's class. He's going to mess me up. I better get up at 2 in the morning, eat a dozen eggs and five avocados. Oh, commitment. Oh, there it is. All right. <laughs> so last question, I think really sets this up. And I tell you, we're going to actually hold on the last question. We're going to read yeah. it because next week, Mark Bell, Jesse Burdick, the, the unicorn <laughs> dynamic the, twins. The unicorn wrecking crew. <laughs> Two of the best strength coaches I've ever met. Most, uh, most kind of interesting thing in, in the field of strength as in terms of applying it to a general population. Jesse runs PowerWad. Mark has now the only strength magazine in the country. Powerlifting USA went out of business. Very, very innovative young men. So I'm um, excited. And they just came back from the Arnold. They're going to give us a report about what they're seeing. Uh, it's exciting. So yeah. battle set. So this question, this last question... So here we go from Ted. Uh, he asked, can you guys address lumbar flexion in the setup for the deadlift or the bottom position of the clean or snatch and give some ideas on improving that position? No problem. Well, so uh, I'm sure Mark well. and Jesse have a few <laughs> ideas about pulling like a wilted piece of spinach in the bottom position. I mean, I, I technically, I don't think that's a deadlift, right? No. Or a clean. It's by definition not one of those things. But uh, we're going to have two of the best experts in the world, and we'll pump this question to them. But that sets us up. Yeah. Another great episode of GPTV. Um, <sighs> Christy Phillips was amazing. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.